everybody, and thank you very much for, for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, I'll use this then. Uh, so, thank you very much for, for joining me. For those of you that were here two years ago, this is an update on, on the region project. Uh, so, I'll be filling you in with regard to what's happened since uh, 2016. For the benefit of those that were not here um, two years ago, and for the benefit of those that have never heard me speak about the Phoenician shipwreck, if there is anybody, um, I'm going to, the talk will, will run something like this. I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction about the site, okay, to bring everybody up to scratch and to jolt, jolt your memories, and then we'll, uh, we'll go, we'll, we'll discuss a bit about how we got to where we are, where we are at this point, and then I'll, uh, I'll shed some light about with regard to what we did in 2018 and what we hope to do in the, uh, in the coming years. And okay, without further ado, so uh, no, I'm, I'm going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes. There'll be time, ample time for questions and answers, uh, and then at the end, for those of you who behave yourselves and. and don't fall asleep and stay here till the end, there's a little surprise. That got your attention. <laughs> okay. I hope there's no one American. You can tell I gave this to an American audience last because I need to explain to them where Malta is. <laughs> okay, and then especially Gonzo. And anyway, the important thing from these few slides is the location of, of, of our shipwreck. This is Schlendi Bay, I call it the small bay, the inner bay, and this part here, the outer bay. Our shipwreck is relatively close to the shore, just under uh, Russell Wardia, but in, 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 in deep water. So despite being so close to the shore, it's situated at a depth of 110 meters. And this is, this is our shipwreck. You can clearly make out the outline okay, of, the, uh, of the ship. It, it uh, measures 12 meters in length approximately by, by four and a half, five meters in width. Okay, and the, it is made up of two, at the extremities there are the, this, these concentrations of grinding stones and I'll come back to them. And then in the center we have uh, an area that is completely dedicated to ceramic objects. Okay, so um, shipwreck situated under Russell Wardia, which is significant in itself because there's, there's, there's a later sanctuary on, uh, on, on that headland, um, just outside of Shenley Bay, and, and situated at a depth of 110 meters. But what I showed you before is just the top part of the car. Uh, a few years ago, we, we ran a sub-bottom survey. A sub-bottom profiler is, is an instrument that allows us to, to look into the sediment, so to speak, and the data we got from, from the sub-bottom profiler confirms that there is at least, at least 1.8 meters of archaeology buried in the, in the sediments. This is really, really good news for us because if something is buried in the sediments, that makes, that gives, uh, so, when something is covered quickly by sediment, this creates an anaerobic um, atmosphere, an anaerobic environment, and where we have no oxygen, things that are organic, like wood, cotton, um, let's say, tusks, you know, ivory, for example, will survive in the archaeological record. So this gives us a lot and a lot of potential with regard to the presence of wood, for example, okay, and we know next to nothing about Phoenician shipbuilding in the archaic period in the 7th century BC. And for the doubting Thomases like me, because if you look back at this, I mean, it's, it's just a bit of fuzz over here. The, the, the technicians, the, the sub bottom engineers, reassure me that it does extend close to two meters. Um, and for the, for the doubting Thomases, you can see at least the second layer popping its head out from, uh, from underneath the, the sediment. We have raised a number of objects since 2000, 
2016. What we do with these objects uh, is we laser scan them to create submillimetric uh, or models of submillimetric precision, and we use these to help us plan sort of the next steps. Okay, so we use these 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 models. We project them into software, and like this, we're able to. So, this is what we see. Okay, we don't see what's underneath the sediment, obviously, but now we know that this amphora is this shape. We know its exact size, so we can project the rest of what we're seeing down into the sediment. So, this helps us. This helps us strategize uh, our our excavation. So, since 2016, we found out that we could work, so we could dive, if, for those of you that, that were not here, 2006, up until 2016, we had only accessed the site remotely, so through the use of robots. One in 2014, we had a manned submersible here, a team from France. In 2016, we, that we, it was the first time that we dived the site, and, and, and that season taught us that we could, we could work, so we could dive and, and spend time working on the site. We could actually work to scientific standards, because no matter how important the site is, or how, how not important an archaeological site is, you can never sacrifice archaeological standards. So we couldn't say, ah, this is a deep site, we only have X amount of minutes on the site, therefore we can, we can sacrifice scientific standards. If that was the case, a decision would have been taken not to proceed. So lesson two was that uh, we, we, uh, we could work to, to scientific standards, and number three was that we needed more funding. When we came to, to apply for funds in 2016, we found it difficult for the 2016 survey, we found it difficult because what we were proposing to do had not really ever been done. So, you know, we had foundations scratching their heads, saying, yes, it, sound gr it sounds great, but it, sound it also sounds a bit risky. So, thank goodness, the, the, the rector believed of, of the university believed in, in the project and said, look, I'm going to give you a small fund if you can pull it off with, with, with uh, you know, for, for one, week, uh, one week's uh, work. I want a, a documentary highlighting the university's research in return. He has a small budget and see what he can do. Okay, so the other thing that, uh, that we learned was that because we could work, and if we could get funding, this is a long-term project. This is not something that we could sort of say, okay, in 2017 and then we'll see. Uh, and we needed long, when I say long term, it would take long to excavate, but also if we, when we start to apply for funding, we need to tell the potential uh, sponsors that, listen, I can't come to you every year not knowing whether I'm going to, you're going to fund me from, on a year-to-year -year basis. You need to guarantee at least four years, because if we start certain things in an excavation, we can't, we can't leave it sort of, uh, how with Martin I do, we can't leave it half shaven as the literal translation. Didn't sound good, but in more cases it sounds right. So, one of the first things that we need to do if, we, if we're in it for, for the long term is to place a, uh, a permanent mooring block, a Mazra Bil Mahdi. The reason being that um, because of the depth, because it's situated in 110 meters, if you have to put down what we call a shot line every time, first of all there is the slight risk, so it's a balance. Do you put it close and risk hitting the wreck? Obviously not. If you put it too far, we only have 12 minutes on the site, so it takes us 8 minutes to, uh, to get to the bottom. We only have 12 minutes on the site and then 2 hours coming up. Just so that you picture the actual depth, it is the height of Porto Maso, okay, the Porto Maso Tower. So if you can imagine divers of taking 8 minutes to swim down, 12 minutes on the side and back up. So what does that mean? If the shipwreck is here and we've put the shot line at a safe distance, the 2 minutes it takes us to swim there is a, a significant percentage of our bottom line. 
That was a bit long-winded, but necessary. So we placed a, 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 a mooring block away from, from, the, from the shipwreck. We, we, put, uh, we dived, we put the lifting bags, and slowly took it very close to where, where we wanted to be. So now every year, what we do is we throw the, the shot line with, uh, with the chain. Obviously, we have to remember to put a buoy, otherwise the whole thing goes down. And the first dive of the year is that we, we with a shackle, we secure this shot line. So now, the ship, the, the, the dive boat is exactly on top of the rear. So when we go down, there's no time wasted, okay? And that was uh, one, uh, the, the 2017, the first thing that we, that we set out to do. Um, this is the setup that we have. It's become better. The, the, we now have a table uh, on, on this side. A lot of overweight middle, middle aged men, including myself, work on this project. Um, on the left hand side, we prepared the rib breathers, okay, the, 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 the gear that our primary breathing apparatus, and on the right hand side is where we have our bailouts. All of these have to be transported on a daily basis from the store to the key. Okay, and then the same thing. At the end of the day, after these long dives, we've got to sort of reverse this, put everything into the van and take it to the garage in, uh, in Schlendi Bay. In, this is, two, I'm showing you stuff from 2017. So in 2017, where one of the major ob objectives was to recover a number of, of uh, amphorae that myself and my co-archaeological director, Jean-Christophe Sorisot from the, from the University of Aix-en-Provence, we identified a number of important uh, objects that we wanted to recover to study uh, closer and uh, we did this by means of hand fanning. So when you do this underwater, you, 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 you dis dislodge the sediments and the sand and you're able to remove the object. So we're, here we're scratching the surface, not so much you know, scratching under the surface. And 2017, we worked for two weeks rather than the one week that we worked in 2016, and we successfully recovered a, a number of objects. This is the team working. You can see how close we brought the mooring block so that when we're down, we're actually, even when we're 10 meters up, and if I'm going to work here, I don't come down and swim like that. To save 30 seconds, I swim diagonally, or we swim diagonally to wherever we're, uh, we're working. The other advantage, sorry, the other advantage of having the, the, the dive boat right on top is that whenever we lower our equipment, we lower it exactly near the shipwreck. So here you see the basket, we can lower equipment in the basket, we can also raise objects in the basket. We prepare them away from the site, which is what, what you're seeing here, and eventually we will lift them. We obviously never lift them together with equipment. We, we don't mind leaving them there overnight or two days and then lift them uh, at, a, at a later time. One thing that is imperative to note is that after every single day of work, so imagine if we do two dives, that's 24 minutes of work, the third dive is dedicated to creating a 3D model of the site. Okay, so there's never a day that goes by that we do not record the disturbance that we've uh, caused on the, on, on the site. Um, that's from a bit far away, so now you're seeing the objects, there's no equipment inside, some of, some of the broken fragments, some of the whole fragments, we're filling the, uh, the airbag, the, sorry, the, the lifting bag with air. This is connected to the shot line. Why? Because if we send it up loose or free, you know, knowing my luck, this thing will, something will happen halfway up and fall, and it will be very difficult to find, very embarrassing to, to, to you know, tell my bosses that I've lost four pieces of archaic uh, pottery, etc., etc. So, as a safety, we have, we have it connected to the shot line. We have surface divers, uh, wait, well, shallow divers waiting close to the surface. They, they, they gently push, uh, push the basket towards the dive boat, which has a lift, and then brought on board where we have um, buckets waiting with, with sea water.
So this gives you a clear idea of what we were up to in 2016. You can see three divers who are hand fanning, uh, dislodging the, uh, the, the sediment. The other diver on the, on the left who's swimming towards them is the safety diver. So his job is to literally float around and just make sure that we're keeping within our parameters. When you're doing something sort of as exciting as, as this, it's very easy to lose track of time. And then we have the photographer, and obviously there's somebody else who's, who's filming this and who was unlikely to have a couple of droplets in his housing, but it adds, it adds to, the, to the atmosphere. As I said, after every single dive, it's actually in 2017 and 2018, it's the first dive that we do, okay? So uh, the first team is the 3D team. You see the, uh, the main cameraman who's got a, a full frame camera, so, so basically a very high resolution camera, and also a GoPro on top. So just in case something happens, Okay? Keep in mind that everything is timed. We know that they, they have uh, 8 minutes to go down, 12 minutes on the side. So after 12 minutes after they're down, the second team starts to go down and you know, they're going to start working. So we can't afford for anything to fail. So just in case something goes wrong with the main camera, everything's being also being recorded on a GoPro. And then besides that, we also have secondary uh, light, light, light men or light, light women who, who you know, provide uh, provide more light, and they also do away with the shadows. So essentially, with with regard to the modelling of the shipwreck, ideally you have a fantastic camera and fantastic lights, which is what we're using here. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel as though I'm speaking to my students. But I'd rather have a mediocre camera and brilliant lights and fantastic lights rather than the other way around. You will get a better model with a not so good camera and fantastic lights. Right, Joe? Okay, good. I got that right. And this is the model that, uh, that we produced at the end of 2017. You can clearly see an area where we worked. We hand found and cleared four pieces from, the, from here, and we also hand found and cleared uh, two pieces from this area over, over here. Okay, I was mentioning, um, I was mentioning the length of the dive, okay? So eight minutes to go down, 12 minutes on the side, two hours to come up, the bulk of which are spent on a, what we call a trapeze. So this thing here has two stainless steel, three stainless steel poles, one at nine, one at six, and one at three meters, and the bulk of your time is spent over there. What's happening here is that we're allowing time for the gases to come out of our system, to come out of our tissues, basically. And then, uh, based on our computers and our dive plans, we, uh, we, we, we come up so when it's, uh, when it's safe. These are connected to these boys, so if there's a strong current, which there often is, underneath Russell Wildea, we disconnect the, uh, the trapeze from the main shot line and we just literally move, move, with, the, move with the current. You know, it can, it can take some time, some of us uh, have longer decompression times, especially if we're diving two, three, four days in a row, the decompression can build up and we literally spend the bulk of our time in the water is spent like that. This is a typical dive profile. Okay, so we're in the water, five meters, we're, we're doing what we call a bubble check, so I check the, the, the chap I'm diving with, he checks me, okay, everything's okay, we descend, so you see between five and this is time, eight minutes we're on the bottom, that's the time we spend on the bottom, and then this is the time we spend coming up, and each one of these represents a safety stop, okay, which is programmed by, by our computers. This is a, uh, 
a small wreck with a uh, with a big impact, though, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really so proud that it's situated here because there's, there's this fantastic island, you know, which, which I absolutely adore, which has a number of unique features, both natural and uh, man-made or human-made. Let me be uh, a bit of PC here, yeah, okay? So, um, and and now we've added something else. So it's not just Chianti. Uh, it's not just the Duera area. Now we've got this Phoenician shipwreck where people from all over the world are flocking to come and, and work with us, okay? Be they divers or 3D experts and so on. Um, actually, on the field. But and then we're also generating a lot of research avenues, which when you think that this site measures 12 by 5, 60 times 2, 120 cubic meters, you know, we've got the University of Tübingen, which is carrying out lipid analysis. So they're testing the facts from inside the ceramics to see whether they can distinguish what the cargoes were. Initial indications are that it was carrying wine. But the Germans being Germans, they want to be absolutely sure. So this year, 2018, they got us to take samples from 20 meters away from the wreck around the wreck to see whether, uh, as controlled samples, they wanted to be sure that what they're seeing in, 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 the, in the results is not something that is happening naturally. So they're going to see whether they can see the same results. If not, we can confirm that it's carrying wine. We have Dr. Anastasi from our department, brilliant young lady. She's working with an Italian archaeologist, Capelli. They take samples of the ceramics. They, they, have what they do what's called thin slices, they look at them for hours on end, and they can actually identify where the clay is from. Okay, because the clay in Malta is different to the clay in Sicily, which is different to the clay in Pantelleria, etc. etc. There's that. We took samples of the grinding stones and sent them to a laboratory. This is we're collaborating with the University of Urbino. He is the foremost expert on uh, volcanic grinding stones in the ancient world. He's a geologist, not an archaeologist. We sent them to the, uh, a lab in Canada and got the results back. Somebody from the University of Oxford is working on DNA. We're seeing whether we can sample ancient DNA from the shipwreck. Massive on computer sciences. We, we collaborate with the CNRS in France, okay, and they're using our data, so data that we're generating in 12 minutes to develop all these uh, incredible applications. I'm also glad, this is a bit of a sort of foray programmer, that we've got two people here from Bosnia who are working on a project called IMARE. It is a Horizon 2020, so when you mention a Horizon 2020 project, it's a pretty big, big thing in, in European, uh, when it comes to European Union projects. And their idea, which is you know commendable, is to take shipwrecks to the general public via virtual reality, okay, and so they've chosen, I'm proud to say that they've chosen our shipwreck as one of, the, one of those that's going to be presented to the general public. Last but not least, we also have an expert who's working on pollen from, uh, from, from the shipwreck. Now, there are two, um, two things that pollen can tell us. There could be pollen residue, let's say, from what the shipwreck was carrying. But even more incredible is the following. When we take cores to reconstruct past environments, we always disregard the first two meters because the idea is that the first two meters have always been sort of jumbled about. Now what happens when the shipwreck sunk, the lids of the amphorae you know, they would have been sealed with a ceramic disc or a wooden disc or a cork disc, some, you know, maybe with pitch or, or, or some, some kind of organic material. This will rot, the, 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 the covers, the, the seals fall away and obviously the contents disappear. So now you have these empty receptacles just outside Chilendi Bay. We all know what happens at Chilendi Bay when it rains. We have, you know, Yam and it takes down these tons and tons of sediment. And the further out you go from the sea, and if you've been to Chilendi Bay after a strong 
um, after a big rain, rain storm, you'll see sort of the sea, which is brown, that's suspended particles, soil, all the stuff that came from, from the countryside. These fine sediments eventually settled on the seabed, and because we've got these empty receptacles, okay, these amphorae, slowly, over the years, these have filled with these fine sediments. So what we did is, with one of the big uh, jars, we took a core, we sliced this core into many pieces of whatever, five centimeters, uh, took three carbon C14 dates, the top of the layer dates to minus 500 BP, the middle one is minus 1000 BP, and the bottom one is spot on minus 1500 BP. So now we have an environmental record. We can actually read what was going on in Gozo at a very important time in the Middle Ages, for example. We can see whether they were growing olives, whether they had, whether they had changed to grapes or cotton, etc. Et the results have yet to, have yet to come up. I dedicate so much time to this because the expert looking at the pollen is my wife and once I didn't mention her when she was at the talk and <laughs> boy, did I suffer for it, okay? So please, Dr. Belinda Gambin from the Institute of Earth Systems, she's the palynologist looking, looking at that, but well, great stuff. Okay, so lessons learned from 2017 that we needed to excavate because there was no way we could justify just continuing to pick. So, well, okay, that's nice, so let's take that, that's nice. Whatever we could learn from the surface, we, we had learned, or, or we had gathered, rather, and we can learn in the years to come, because the three weeks is just a small part. It's like the, the, the proverb, the tip of the iceberg, all the other work comes, comes after that. So, in order to take this further, we, 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 we were at a crossroads. We either stop now, or we take this further. To take this further, we needed to excavate. I'm sorry, that's a big but. I, I didn't mean it that, that way, but... Why? Why? Because nobody, nobody, nobody had ever done such a thing in the past. So I could not turn to the UNESCO management for activities aimed at underwater culture heritage turn to page 73 and say, okay, I've got to do this and that. You know, so there's no manual out there that covers the operation that we wanted to do. This is me happy with my new iPad Pro and my pen. Okay, so finally I can draw and draw, well, draw, draw, sketch, okay, so how I could see the the, the site evolving. So this we had, okay, that's the uh, that's the site, that's the mooring block, we needed a pump and now generally when we work on, when we excavate underwater, you have a water pump, it pushes water through through a Y, okay, and if, when you have water going that way, it creates a vacuum that way, so you have a, a flexible pipe and you can literally suck up the sediment that you're, uh, that you're dislodging. But to have a water pump that is on the surface and has to pump water down 13 atmospheres, you'd need a water pump half the size of this room, so it'd need a big ship, which obviously we didn't have. So we have to think of something else. I'll, I'll show you the solution. So that became this. This is the site. This is where we wanted to excavate. Okay, the mooring block, we needed to put down uh, mapping points, permanent mapping points, a submersible pump, okay, with hydraulic pipes connected to a hydraulic machine on the, on the surface. The other thing that we needed to solve was lighting. Why? Because individual divers, when, when, when uh, technical divers have torches attached to their arms and if they're hand fanning it's like being in a, in a Star Wars film and you've got <laughs> six people with lightsabers and you know I was about to get an epileptic fit at one, at one go, that's all I needed, that, you know. So we said, I said okay, if we're going to excavate, divers will not be allowed to have their, their personal torch but we need to provide light, okay, so I, I figured this out with a tripod, a, a powerful light, etc. 
So all these things, you know, I, I send these kind of sketches to uh, the team, uh, to all sorts of hours, weekends, etc. They're, they're now used to me. Um, and the idea was this. So we needed six permanent mapping points, okay? So these would be placed and kept there for the entire excavation. Why? Because where you have three points, you can take a precise triaturation. Your geometry is uh, spot on. The area we decided to excavate is here. Why? Because we still don't know where the front and back of the ship is, so we want to determine whether we're looking at, at the stern or the bow. This is also the place where the ceramics meet the, uh, the grinding stone, so we want to see the relationship with regard to how they're stored. And at either extremity, a ship, a boat comes up, so one of the things that we're really interested in is to see whether we can actually uncover the, the, the wooden structure, okay, the hull of the Phoenician shipwreck. Remember, we know nothing about Phoenician shipwreck in, in the archaic period, and therefore we've got more of a chance coming across wood, which is shallow in the sediment at the extremities. These cross lines are measurements which will give us sort of even more precise measurements for the, for the objects. Okay, so this takes a lot of preparation. Charlie and Seb, two of the team. This is all equipment that eventually goes into a van, not this one obviously, um, or two, and goes up to goes up to Gozo permanently for three and a half weeks. You know, the rope or the bins for, for, for the objects. Charlie is working on the grid system. Seb is working on, on the tripod. Okay, which, which uh, we, we designed specifically for this, and this is sort of the light being tested. Okay, this is a massive 30,000 lumen uh, underwater light. The job of, the, of one of the divers would be to clip it on and, and switch it on so that it illuminates the, the, the entire site for the whole 36 minutes that we're, we're down there. And RPM Nautical were gracious enough to lend me the, the research vessel for for a day and what we did is with the with the ROV with the remote operating vehicle and their crane we lowered the uh, the mapping points the anchor points and this is a 3D uh, survey well it's actually in 2D but this is this is an auto photo of the site when we got it ready so the six points are in place we even had the Phoenician project uh, discs made to go on them with all with scales as well. Uh, a, a friend of ours and, and colleague of mine, John Wood, developed this. We call it the Johnometer. What this is is, is a two by two by two meters. It's got a spirit level, okay? A water, obviously a, a waterproof spirit level. It's got three adjustable legs, okay? And these are three ceramic tiles so that the legs don't sink into into the sediment, once we get it level, now we can get precise measurements, not only in X and Y, but we can also measure Z, we can measure depth. Stick with me and I'll show you what a miracle this guy managed to, managed to pull off. So that is the, these are two by two meters, Okay, so we're, 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 we're excavating four by two. These are subsequently, where you see the black, these are subsequently divided into one by one quadrant. So we know within a square meter exactly where the objects lie. And then when we map the cell, everything goes into an electronic database. That's our grid. Those are our points and everything matches. To, uh, to perfection. And, you know, plus or minus three millimeters when you're only working for 12 minutes, I think is pretty acceptable. After every dive, this is the scene at the apartments in Gozo. So a lot of processing. Kari will process a light model in the evening so that we can actually plan for, for the next day. And um, these guys, this is my, my colleague for archaeology, Jean-Christophe. Um, this is my research support officer, Darko, who's, who's working on the, on the GIS database. 
This is Pierre Drat, the, the computer science expert. They're working on, on other stuff, giving electronic numbers. This is all constantly going on, all the time, all the time. And this is what Piedra works on. So this is all online. I'll give, you, I'll give you what to Google later. So essentially you can go online and search and say, show me the objects that were raised in 2016. Boop, and it will make, give you a color. Show me the objects that were raised in the and it will give you a color. Show me the entire autophoto. So you don't only see it as a sketch, but you see it with the photograph. Show me the photograph of 2017, etc. Et and as I said, this is all available online. You can stay playing about, measuring, moving the, the site in 3D, etc. And so what we're doing now is with the scan of the actual amphora, okay, the French guys are actually now replacing these with the actual, actually sized amphora, okay? And again, we can start them off all grey, you can see here the different dates and whatever you click on, it will bring to colour, bring to life, so to speak, what, what, has been, what has been raised. Last year we also tried to use the university's AUV, this is an automated underwater vehicle, um, we had some technical issues, um, and I kid you not, it's not sort of a bad workman blaming his tools. But we had some technical, tech, it's brand new, we had some technical issues with the, with the nozzle, um, and we really didn't get what we wanted to get, but we're going to go back next summer, I'm not one who gives up easily, and we're going get, to get good results. But this is one of the scans that, that, it, that it got, and it's reminiscent of my sketch with, uh, with, with, with uh, the iPad, you can see the site over here, the anchor points, the Masra, the grid, etc. And these are the pipes related to the excavation. So this is the material that we took down. This is the hydraulic pipe, which goes all the way down to the pump. So now the pump is not on the surface. The hydraulic pump is at 95 meters depth. So it only has to pump from 95 meters to 110. This needs power, and the power is derived from a hydraulic machine on the, on the boat. This system was used for the first time on the Antikythera shipwreck a couple of years ago. We got in touch, but they excavate in 55 meters, literally half the, the depth that we work in. They said, listen, it's work for us, make your calculations. Joe Parwan in the background, I'm always giving him this difficult maths to uh, to, to calculate for me with regard to pressure and, and, and the power of the pump, and we, we, we figured out that we, we had. Joe, you remember we had tried other concepts, you know, of, of putting down banks of air and driving the, the, the dredge with air, but ultimately it came down to this. We had the chance of testing it in July last year, and it worked absolutely beautifully. This is a typical uh, whiteboard, okay, so Tuesday 11th September, uh, Kari will be doing 3D, David Grace will be doing pipes, dredges and pumps, you can see he's a hard worker. Team 2, uh, PVT will be excavating, light on tripod and then safety diver excavation, level 2B stroke 2C. I like how I'm designated, I'm a floater, I can do what I want. Um, and then the last team, whoever goes on last, to remove dredges from grids so that it will be clear for 3D. Very, very, I mean, precise instructions, because just to reiterate, when you, when you have 12 minutes, you have no time to, to lose. Typical scene, divers from Malta, Finland, United States, South Africa, etc., all, all together, so with one aim is to, to, to study and excavate this site, and here you see the, uh, the excavation underway. So the tripod providing the light, the grid in place, this pipe is pumping water, creating a vacuum. There are two of these, so this guy's excavating this quadrant, he's excavating here, okay, and that's sort of what, what we do. And you can see the fine sediment going, going up into, into the water column. The bulk of the sediment, though, funnily enough, is being sucked in and, and, and drained away. You can see, see more. <coughs> These are the photos. <laughs> okay, 
so here you can see this is the, the, the surface. Okay, so when you when you hand you hand fan you dislodge the sediment and then the, the sort of the giant vacuum cleaner uh, cleans cleans it up. You must never forget to check. You know, keep in mind that we are diving. There are challenging dives as well. And as I mentioned before, it's very easy to lose sight of your compute and your parameters. So, you know, the, the diver there, John sort of checked his, his computer, everything's okay, and continue with the, with the excavation. Very important. So when we excavate in five, six meters of water, it's actually very easy at the end of the day, uh, the last divers have to check the spoiling because the drain if let's say it's draining here, will create a heap. You send the diver, the diver looks through the heap, and if you've missed something, I don't know, the, the, the famous discovered that these three lights are enough, and actually there's no GoPro either this time. And because we were only working in this 4x2, so we did the, the, the photogrammetry of the entire site before we started, uh, the one with the geometer, the right angled uh, scale. But and then all we had to do was, uh, well, all we had to do was take a very detailed photogrammetric survey of the 4x2, because this is the only place we, we, we were disturbed. Now, this is the magic that John is working on. So because now we can measure X, X, Y, and Z, we can now start to compare one model to another and actually measure how far down we're going. The colors represent different heights of the bottom or rather different depths, okay? You can clearly see where we've been working in these two quadrants, this going down over there. And what's interesting is, this is the first layer, we started to expose the second layer. So what's happened here, this is, the, this is the side of the ship, which would have been upright. That nasty worm, the Teredos, would have eaten away until it becomes too weak to support the amphorae. It would have fallen, and here you can actually see the direction to which the amphorae, is, the amphorae fell. Okay, so this is the level. That we that we've reached so far. Actually, we, we, we've got further than that. And if you go into detail, this is what's called a point cloud. So all these little points taken from our photo from our photographs, and the colours are representative of different heights. Okay. With the red being being deeper. I want you to watch closely. Okay. So this was the beginning. And that's how we left it. Okay, so we'll play that again. Just watch these three here. I must say that in 2018, progress with the excavation was ex excruciatingly slow. Not the excavation itself, but the setting up of the of, of the Italian say il campo, you know, setting up the, the sort of the field to start working because we had never done it, no one's ever done it before, certainly we hadn't done, done it before. So it took us the bulk of the, of, of the first half of the project, the first 10, 11 days, to set it up and then obviously once we started excavating it was, it was okay. This year we know exactly what we have to do, so hopefully we'll be excavating from, I wouldn't say day one, but, you know, from, from quite early on in, in, the, in the project. For every single day of excavation, we've got a heat map like this. This gives you the, the, the depth below seabed, with red being the deepest, okay? So you can see where we remove the amphorae, it's actually 35 centimeters below the, the seabed. So again, you know, we're measuring on a daily level how, how far down we're going. And this is a, basically a bathymetric map created from photogrammetry of the site I, as we finished, not as we left it, because after we did this, the last job was to cover 
the 4x4, four 4x2 by four, four by area with geotextile, we covered it anyway. So you can see that this site is completely undisturbed. You can actually see the 4x2, we've removed the grid, okay? You've, you can see where we removed the objects. You can see where we also see where we've made great progress. And from this image, I know exactly where I want to attack, where I want to continue in 2019, which is certainly in this area. Here, we will be removing one, two, three, and four, okay? And then we'll have what will start to, to manifest itself is a clear image of the second, of the second layer. And again, this is, this is the site, uh, so that image is produced from the same, from the, the previous image is produced from the same model, you can see so far D. There is an extremely rare bow, uh, urn over here, my jungle stuff is still raised, it raised, that's the patience, it, it's been there for 2,700 years, it will be there next year, you know, I want to get to its level on the entire site, you see, I've got to excavate here and here, get it down to that level, record, and then we, we will recover. Where, where you see the grey areas, the, this is that second layer I was showing you, the grey areas where, where underneath the sediment, this, these are what we're going to remove first, one, two, three, four, and then excavate down, down here. So in reality, for, for the years that we, we have uh, funding, which is next year and at least another two, we're going to be working in this area. I can't see us doing the whole thing. We're definitely not doing the whole thing with the, in, in the four years that we have funding, funding for. Okay, um, so I'm obsessive about sharing this project with anybody who's willing to listen, um, be it online, virtually, and one of the things we did on, on the 22nd of September, so literally just as our project was coming to, to an end, if we didn't have enough stress already in the background, Heritage Malta were working towards this small but, but wonderful exhibition, which is um, hosted in, in half, we've stolen half of the head office. And the idea is, is uh, it's open for free, okay? So, so you can visit uh, whenever you like, as long as it's sort of within working hours, within working office hours, Monday to Friday. Uh, and the idea is that, that the way it's designed is that next year, if there's something else that we want to display, we can actually change the objects. Okay, so uh, we currently have objects from 2017 and uh, 2017 that have been, have, gone, have been desalinated and are dry and ready for display. And then the ones from 2018 are currently undergoing desalination. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. It's open since September 22nd. We've had just under 20,000 people visiting the museum, which is, you know, fantastic. Heritage Water sent out an Excel sheet of every every month, extremely professional, and, and it makes me really, really proud. Of. Okay, so. I'm here alone, and then it sounds like I'm, you know, like I'm some kind of Superman, which I'm obviously not, because behind me, uh, not, you know, behind me, to my side, in front of me, all around me, I've got an incredible, incredible team of people who I am ex extremely proud to, to work with, and without them, uh, none, of, none of this would be, would be possible, just as it would not be possible without the support from from the institutions that, that have shown faith in this project. So, on behalf of everybody there and myself, I'd like to say thank you for giving me your attention. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have any questions, fire away. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's fascinating to hear about the process. Really enjoyed that. I'm just interested in maybe it's like the bigger picture. So if you, if you look at sort of Venetian shipbuilding, Venetian commerce, and stuff, are there any sort of hypotheses about how they went about those things, which you think that this exercise will either prove or disprove? Okay. It's 
obviously the bigger picture is what we want to contribute to. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating being able to look at pollen, but if, this, if the pollen doesn't feed into a bigger picture such as the, the, the long-term environmental history of Gozo, then it's, it's not useless, but it's not as important. Let's go beyond our island. So some of the results, which I failed to mention, but you know, I, I, I was sure that I'd get a chance to mention them in the question and answer time. Uh, the, the, for example, the grinding stones we have tested, as I mentioned, we know for a fact that they come from a tiny corner of Pantelleria, okay, which is an island which is basically just off, just off Russell Wildea, that's a long shot, but sort of, you know, west, westwards from Russell Wildea. Now, this is, this is the beauty of this shipwreck and why it's sort of a small site that's having a big impact. So now the archaeological community out there who studies sort of trade in the archaic world, okay, and keep in mind that the 7th century BC is a time of turmoil in the central Mediterranean. People are arriving from the east, okay? Uh, don't think of migration and movement of people as something current. This is happening way back when. People are coming out of the east, the Greeks from Greece, Phoenicians from Lebanon, they're moving into spaces that are already occupied by people. They, they're not occupying, vac occupying vacuums. They're bringing with them religion, habits of food, habits of drink, different cultures, opportunity for trade, possibly aggression in the case of, 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 of the Greeks, for example. We know that in Sicily, they aggressively took over Syracuse 30 years before our ship sank. So, it would be foolish to just look at the shipwreck with sort of blinds on. We need to see where this fits into this massive picture. And to me, the incredible thing is that we're seeing everyday goods, grinding stones, the equivalent of having a Kenwood in your kitchen. Yet, they're in this time of turmoil, it's, it's if they're important enough to have them cut in Pantelleria and an archaeologist in Spain, Cadiz, in Atlantic Spain, excavating the archaic levels, finds a piece of a grinding stone exactly like the one we have on our shipwreck. So now, Gozo is forming very much part of this huge Phoenician network. I'm not saying that they went from here directly to Cadiz, but now we're in good, thanks to the Boston shipwreck, to the, the Schnelli wreck, we know how they were stacked, we know how they traveled, and now thanks to this excavation in Spain, we know how far they were getting, okay? And it's the same with the pottery. We've sampled the pottery. Two, till two years ago, I was convinced that this ship was coming from the north, from Sardinia, Petekuse, what is today Ischia, then Mozia, on the western side of Sicily. I even had a map in my early presentations. And then Pantelleria, Gozo, Malta, and I thought it would continue to what is today Libya and then to Carthage. This is the beauty of science. I, I, I'm unashamedly, I, stand, I can stand here and say, I was completely wrong. This is a, a south-north, because now we have confirmed ceramics from Carthage, the clay, there, there are amphorae, which are clearly made in Tunisia. So leaving from North Africa, Pantelleria, picking up the grinding stones, they're coming to Malta not by accident, like, like St. Paul did, uh, you know, 700 years later, Porcia. Um, but they're coming here to trade because some of the clay of some of the, the ceramic objects is definitely Gosselin and definitely Maltese. We've now scientifically proven that. So again, we're not just sort of passive receptors, but we're very, very much involved actively in this, in this sort of turmoil of the 7th century BC. I have no idea whether I answered your question, but oh, you got me going. You know? <laughs> next, next, was there someone at the back? Yes, yes sir. From a practical point of view of the actual excavation itself, do you anticipate any solidifying of the sediment as you go deeper and deeper, and so making the excavation more difficult? Oh, you are a pessimist. <laughs> no, no. Listen, there is a possibility, but we do have a tool which, uh, very original, so John Wood made the Johnometer. 
I came up with a tool, and they call it the Gambinator. It's a stainless steel rod which is connected to, uh, to, to a cylinder to compress there. It's got a lot of fine holes. We, we, if, if it's too solid, we can push this in, open the cylinder, and that dislodges the sediment. Sometimes it works well. Some, so we do have like a contingency in case that happens. But I don't mind because the more compact and the more anaerobic the synth is, the better preserved the wood and other organic stuff as well. Daniel? Two questions. Yes. Um, one of curiosity. Down there, there are no currents in itself. I mean, <coughs> that deep. Does everything stay as is? I mean, let's say you go down this year, last year, and you left, you forgot something down there, you forgot a flashlight, for mm -hmm. example. Would you find it exactly the same you place? You find it exactly the same place because we did leave some tools on the on the uh, grinding stones, but sediment moves. I've got, with regard to sediment, two answers because from one year to the next, we do see slight changes. We say, oh, the amphora wasn't as uncovered as it is now, or oh, that's covered even more. Plus, till 2018, we were always working kind of, uh, not a kind of, we were always a day behind. Why? Because we'd finished work, the la and, and then the first dive the next day. So by the time that model is made, we would have already disturbed the site. What we did this year, because, you know, it was something that was really, it was a stone in my shoe, it was bothering me that we, you know, we still were pretty precise, but it was bothering me. So we left a GoPro down to see how long the, sed the suspended sediment takes to disperse. It takes 15 minutes to move. So there, that means that there is current, but not strong enough that it's going to move you and body. On the surface, sometimes, yes. Um, Your second question, I'll come to you. Don't, don't worry. With hydrology, uh -huh. um, is this going to make any difference with what we know on land? Are things sort of more, you know, working in the same as the archaeology has told us till now on land, or it's going to <laughs> okay. change? So, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, okay, look, beyond Malta, definitely, because as, as I already mentioned, we're looking at how things were transported, what was transported, even the fact that they're carrying wine in jars that are not. Re and Here's one, one, one crucial thing. Actually, I can say uncategorically, yes, and I'll explain why. The reason we thought that this ship was coming from north to south was it, uh, because it's carrying a type of amphora, which is a Zit uh, R, okay, it's, a, it's, a German, it's, a, it's an abbreviation for a German name, which we know for a fact originated in the Tyrrhenian area. So these are being made in what is today Ischia, and they were copying them in, um, in, in Sardinia. And this wine from Ischia was highly, highly regarded. So when we saw a lot of these amphoras, this must have come from the Tyrrhenian. They're, they're screaming at us. We tested the clay, and these amphorae are Maltese. So the, Finito, the inhabitants of the islands at the time are copying amphorae that are carrying a very, very fine wine from a very specific place. Now, what are they doing? Are they forging? Are they allowed to copy this wine because Ischia is a small island, Malta is a small island, and the quality is possibly the same? Or are they saying, hmm, in Cadiz, who's, who the hell is going to know that our wine is not the real Ischian wine? Okay, so. This starts to inform, I mean, like, what were the locals doing in 700 BC? For sure they were growing grapes. Now we, can, we don't have to wait to find a, uh, a, 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 a press. They were making amphorae. We don't need to find the kiln. It would be great to find the kiln or a pit where they were made, but now we know that they were making them. Okay? We know that they were making them by hand, so we know that the wheel hadn't arrived yet, etc., etc. So is it impacting what we know on them? Of course it is. And this is just the first level. I'm really fingers crossed that there's some more stuff. And to be honest, I am and I'm not. If it's more of the same, welcome. It's, it's just going to tell. It's just going to reinforce the fact that sort of everyday goods like wine 
and whatever the earns were, were carrying in the grinding stones were worth the investment and the risk of transporting them over, over long distances. And I think this will also percolate into also the archaeology of, of the central Mediterranean as well. Yes, sir. Uh, is this site uh, secured against other divers? Uh, the, the simple answer is no. We have had somebody fly a drone to get the position, but uh, even we, who, with the University of Malta, who has a panel from the superintendent, we informed the armed forces, etc. And you know, I really hats off to the people of Schmendi because whenever we were out there, lo and behold, the armed, the patrol boat hands up. Schlendi, there are you know people who are very proud and keep an eye. The long term, well, long term, the medium term idea, Munchal Local Council has just one funding to restore the tower. I have Heritage Malta and Munchal Local Council talking. We're going to put very rugged uh, CCTV to one pointing towards the tower wreck, because there's another wreck subject of another talk. If you can bear to hear my voice again. Coming soon, watch this space, and then one pointing towards Russell Wardia. And the idea is that these will be will also be available on the web. So it's not just the AFN who's looking at the screen, but you, me, Dan, etc. It will, you know, that's 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 the idea. So they will be physically physically monitored within the next 18 months. So, Marie, Marie, there are people. Yes, yes, but, but, but the people who have submarines also have an AI an automated uh, uh, information system, we can, we, not we can, we do track them a new unit of heritage more that's a whole permitting system, monitoring system, etc. This one Sorry. of Yes, ma'am. I'll come to you in a, in a minute. Uh, towards the end, you've mentioned that there's a rare urn that you want to find and, and bring up. Can you enlighten us a bit more? Yes, about so there are a number of urns from the site. If, if you go to the have you been to the exhibition? No, I don't know. No, no, no. You must go to the exhibition. There, is, there are two objects which, for which there are nothing like them anywhere in the Mediterranean. Okay, so these are two extremely rare objects. That we've been, myself and John Christophe have been going over publications, other publications, etc. They're, they're, they're one-offs, literally, so far. So, I mentioned about nine types. We started counting, we had counted four. This is yet another type. It's a type of N, very similar to the other ends, but <coughs> smaller. What's, what's the Russian dog called? There is, so something like that. We've got sort of three ends getting smaller and smaller. Until I get my hands on it. On it. I can't give you a proper answer. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am? Um, there was a big earthquake and tsunami. 
will actually see big heavy objects floating on the debris, floating on, on, on the bamboo. So very easily, you know, amphorae could have been washed out and then sunk, sunk further up. We've even found cars from that. Uh, from that uh. So that is very much in, our, in, in the back of our mind at the death of 1693. You're all very well behaved, so I'm going to have to give you the nice surprise. So I'd like to, I'd like to gather around that, that, green, that green table. Okay, so thank you, thank you again. <laughs> You have to Google Grove